Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. That's a good word, Frank. Thank you, buddy. If you want to have your future, the blessings of your future look good, deal with the issues of today. Amen? I like that. It's kind of a little bit what I alluded to last week about dealing with things in order to clean your rooms in order to get the glory of God to come back into those areas of your life that you have been reluctant to put on the altar. Um, God, I'm just like, I thought I forgot my glasses there for a second. Okay, I want to talk about faith. You know, I, I grew up, I got saved in 84, so I was like right in the middle of the whole Word of Faith movement. And uh, it was a blessing. Uh, I believe in it, I preach it, I teach it, I love it, um, but there was more to a lot of what we were being taught in the late 80s and 90s. Uh, faith is progressive. God gives you revelation at a certain level, and he, lives, he, allow, he blesses you by operating on a new revelation that you have. But at some point in time, he wants to bring in some more revelation that you would add to uh, what I'm calling your pyramid of promise to get higher into the things of God, right? Uh, if you're born again, and I'm believing that most of you are in here, uh, God gave you the gift of saving faith, right? Uh, somebody somewhere was praying for you because uh, God doesn't really do anything in the earth unless it's a response to prayer. Uh, I know that makes God seem unsovereign, but he's the one that inspires the prayer in order to get you into the kingdom. So with me, I had a sister that was saved before I was, and I was living uh, with all of my strength to please the enemy. And uh, my sister was interceding, and people were coming out of the woodwork to minister to me and stuff, and I just straight-armed everybody that came my way. I didn't want to hear anything that anybody had to say about Jesus or living righteous or any of that stuff. Uh, but God, at the same time that he's having somebody pray for you, is also pulling veils off your, off your eyes and allowing you to see that the track that you're on is not bringing you to your dream or your blessing, and it's actually it's grieving you, it's torturing you. And then if you resist those subtle promptings of God to turn, he'll just allow you to hit the wall. And most of the people that I know that ever gave their life to God hit the wall. It's like, I don't want to hear about Jesus. I don't want to hear about Jesus. And then there's this crash. Oop, and now you start looking, who's that guy that told me about Jesus? I'd like to talk to him and find out what it was that he really wanted to tell me. And that was the case with me. Uh, put up my first scripture here. Let me tell you what it is because I don't know if you have them in order. Hebrews 11.6, you have that one? Oh, no, put up Ephesians. Yeah, that's good. When God gives you faith, he gives you faith by revelation. And so God needs to breathe on the word to inspire faith. Now, there's two kinds of studying in the word. One is that you study the logos, which is the written word of God, and you put it into your soul. You put it into your memory. You commit things to memory. Uh, we had three by five cards back in the day and we would just confess them. We'd put them on our mirror and when we're shaven, we'd say by his stripes we're healed. Right? And that's a good thing. Right? But I noticed that every time there was an activation of a truth of God that I had been saying and saying and saying and saying and saying and saying and not seeing the results that I wanted, God saw my persistency in pursuing the word of God, and one day he breathed on it, and it came alive, right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Part of the hearing is hearing you agree with what God is saying, and part of the hearing is God hearing you say it and saying, all right, I'm going to blow on it, and all of a sudden it comes alive, and it becomes what's called rhema or the spoken word of God, right? 
When God gives you a rhema, it's a revelation knowledge of who he is. And at whatever level that rhema comes, that's your current level of faith. And God expects you to activate and operate at that newly inspired level. Because as you activate and demonstrate that level, it becomes a part of who you are. If you don't activate, then the Bible says when faith cometh, straightway Satan cometh to steal the word. Right? It's like seeds cast to the wayside and the birds of the air come and eat it up and it does not root in your spirit. So any, anything that God breathes on in my life goes in a journal immediately. Sandra and I, we have dreams, or we hear the voice of the Lord, we wake up in the morning, oh my God, and we write it down, right? And sometimes we write, we write things down, we don't even know what they mean, but we heard it. A couple weeks later, we'll be somewhere and somebody will say something and we'll go, oh, that's a piece of the puzzle from the word that we got the other morning when God said this. We grab it, write it in the journal next to the other thing. Next thing you know, it begins to come together. And when it comes together and you see the picture, there it is again. Fresh breath from God. You get what God is trying to say. And now, another level of faith for you. But God starts with us at the beginning. Let me read Ephesians. I see Paul is saying this to a young church, the Ephesian church. He says, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Anytime you get rhema revelation that brings a dimension of the knowledge of God, your heart will swell with fresh faith. When, when you're in that moment, man, start speaking, right? Your squirt gun is loaded. Start shooting, right? Because a lot of times we say things rote. We got things from the Logos, which is good and everything. And, and sometimes even scriptures that we got by inspiration can grow stale. We need fresh revelation from God. I have said probably 100,000 times, well, my God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory. It lost its wind for me. It doesn't mean it can't be win for you. It may be the first time you ever heard it, because the first time I heard it, I grabbed onto it, and it worked for a season, but it's progressive revelation that brings you higher. Does that make sense? Okay. He that, uh, okay, so we know that God gives revelation through knowledge, the, by the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's why Paul said, oh, that I might know him. And the power of his resurrection, right? And so knowledge of God is what we look for. It's why we read the word. We want to see another facet, another dimension of God we've never seen. And sometimes revelation comes through difficult circumstances. Because difficult circumstances give you a seeker's heart. And God responds to the contrite heart or the seeker's heart, right? He doesn't really blow fresh breath on casual inquirers. Make sense? So if you've been casual, if you've got caverns in your soul that need fresh wind, sometimes your circumstances will begin to crumble until you cry out for God. You know, God didn't deliver the children of Israel from Egypt until they cried out. Right? And then what did he do? When the, when the cries of the people were sufficient, to provoke the compassion of God, he sent a deliverer, right? Sometimes for us, that's just fresh wind in the caverns of our soul. Jesus is our deliverer. He's already come. He's already set us free. So what is it for us? What deliverer do we need? We need to be delivered from the ignorance of what God has already done. He's the deliverer, and he's delivered us, and he said it is finished. So it's something that we're not seeing that we need to see, which is revelation knowledge, spirit of wisdom, and revelation knowledge of who he is to us, but not just who he is to us, but who you are to him, right? There should be a whole teaching called in Christ realities, where you are firmly rooted in biblical understanding of your identity in Christ, because that's where the enemy bombards you. You try to believe for something, he's like, who do you think you are? Like, God's going to hear you. Well, let me tell you. And if you've built that into your spirit, 
you take your sword out, you cut them up with truth because you know who you are, right? But unfortunately, a lot of believers don't know who they are, so they have weak faith. They don't know what's been promised, so they have weak faith. They have identity issues. They have trauma. They have things that they have to push through and believe through, and there are different levels of faith. Uh, let's go to uh, Hebrews 11.6. You got that one? But without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. These are entry levels right here. There's a lot of people in the world, they don't even believe God is. You know, they're agnostics and they're atheists in the world. There's humanists, right? And we minister to them. The first step for them is to convince them God is real. Now, if you try to convince them in the flesh, they'll have a better argument than you, right? They're well rehearsed in why they don't believe in God. But if you have a testimony, God will put an anointing on that testimony that they will not be able to resist. Because what they're experiencing is the presence of God in you when you were ministering to them. Somebody came to me when I was all puffed up in philosophy and everything, and he was really not very educated guy. He was just a gardener that sat next to me at a diner in the morning before we went to work. And every day he would tell me, well, that, that philosophy book's not going to help you. This guy again, right? And I said, so I started to share philosophy with him. And I really, from an intellectual standpoint, I pretty much grabbed him by the throat, if you know what I mean. It's a metaphor, okay? And he said, well, I don't know about that. All I know is 1 John 1, 9 says we can bless our sins. And I'm like, oh, God, the word again, right? But the word has wind on it. It has an anointing on it. And I pretended like it didn't bother me, but when I went home, it haunted me. It irritated me. It agitated me right? And I finally came to a point where I thought, okay, well, there's probably a God. I mean, look at all this amazing creation, right? It couldn't have just popped up, right? Uh, natural selection cannot uh, convince me that all of this stuff is by accident. And so you begin to wear down and you begin to believe that place where God is. But with me, it's like, okay, God, there's God, okay, but what am I supposed to do? There's a gazillion people on the planet, I'm just one, we've all got problems, and he's going to like be concerned for me, get real, right? Now, you may have heard this part of my testimony, so I'll share it briefly, but I was in a restaurant one day, studying a book on philosophy, my heart was broken, and uh, I'm just trying to find answers, but remember, God responds to a seeker's heart, Right? He's, he that comes to God must believe that he is, step one, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Well, I didn't know that he was going to reward me, but I was diligently seeking for truth. And God responds to a seeking heart. So a guy walks in, sits down next to me at the counter, orders iced tea, looks next to me right there, and he goes, son, you're not going to find what you're looking for in that book. And I'm like, oh, darn, another one, right? And I said, okay, sir, how so? He said, see that, look out the window. He said, tell me what you see. I don't know. Well, it's my church. I'm a pastor. Uh, every Saturday, I pray and lay hands on the chairs in my church, and I pray that God will give me an awesome message on Sunday for the congregation. That's what I do. I've been doing it for 10 years. For the first time in 10 years, God spoke to me and told me, Maurice, there's a guy across the street. He's looking for me, but he doesn't know it. Go tell him. He walks in and says, guess what, son? You're the only one here, and you're reading a book on philosophy. Now, I thought he was going to lead me to Jesus, but he didn't. He just got up and walked out. <laughs> but it hit me between the eyes because now I believe that God is real and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. My pursuit was enough for God to take me to step two, plus the intercession of my sister. All this was taking place. All these chest moves were my sister groaning in her prayer closet, right? Mothers, don't give up on your kids. Groan in your pear closet. God is moving pieces right now that you can't even see, and one day he's going to say, oh, checkmate, and your kid's going to get saved. Amen? I was an unlikely prospect. We need to believe in the existence of God, but that's impersonal. Yeah, okay, I believe God is real. 
can I just say that's a good step for somebody that was an atheist and agnostic? You know, we used to get a lot of people come in for counseling and stuff. They were new believers and stuff, and, and they cleave to their program. They had addictions, and they, they were in 12-step and that sort of thing. And some of my brothers and sisters criticized that. I said, stop. Stop the nonsense. Program's good. It's one of the steps of God, right? It's not where they should remain, but it's a step, right? They went from, I don't believe in God, to an introduction to a higher power they couldn't even name, right? But guess what? They believe in a higher power. That's progress, right? But now God's going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to show you what that name is, right? And so let them walk out their journey as God leads them and as you pray for them and don't judge them based on where they are on their journey just because you're a little farther in your journey because you were there right I was so we don't want to judge people based on where they are we want to pray and encourage people and try to bring them to the next step God is aware of the seeker's heart your test oh, I shared my testimony at Conrad's so two points God is real and God is aware God is personal. Now, where do we go? We have to know that if God's aware and he's a good God, the enemy will start lying to you. Well, okay, now you know God's real. Now you know that he's aware, but you really think he's going to do anything? Or you really think that you're, you're in such a deep hole, do you really think there's anything that he can do? So now we go into the word. Remember, everything progressive in faith is by revelation, right? So now we need a revelation of the God who has no limitations, Right? So the next verse is Matthew 19, 26. But Jesus beheld them, the bewindled of the 12 apostles in the upper room, and said, they, it, he, he gave a criteria for salvation, and they said, oh, my God, who can be saved? They were freaking out. Right? It just seemed like the criteria was too difficult. And he kind of, he probably, I see him smirking in my spirit, like, <clears throat> they're a little ruffled right now. And then he gives them good news. He said, be of good cheer. All things are possible with God, right? Whatever it is that you're dealing with that's freaking you out, I don't care how deep of a ditch you've dug for yourself, it's nothing for God. It's a, it's, it, he doesn't need all of his breath. It's a little, and you're free, right? It's nothing for God. We need a revelation as we read the word of the bigness of God, Right? Because you, now you know he's aware, you know he's real, now you need to know how big he is. So what are we doing? We're on an adventure studying the facets of God, and each time we get a revelation of a new facet, our faith grows. As we meditate on the scriptures, we will begin to see how omnipotent God really is. If he can create the universe and stop the sun and part the Red Sea, he can heal your body, renew your mind, and cancel your debt. That's nothing for him, right? Now, when you get that by revelation, as you begin to read the word and God begins to speak to you and you cry to say, Lord, I want to see this facet of your bigness and your omnipotence. And he'll begin to lead you in the scriptures and then you'll be able to read something. Then went, you'll feel it. Wow, that's a big God right there. Right. So now you're you're moving forward. You've got another block, another foundation stone for your pyramid of promise. Right. And every time you add a block, you go higher in God. But it always happens with revelation of the knowledge of him and the promises that he gives you. As we read the stories of rescue in the Bible, and they're everywhere, we come to a place where we say to ourselves, he can do this, right? Courage rises in us. Once we establish in the heart, this in our hearts, the enemy comes again. And he bombards us with, yeah, well, okay, he can, but he probably won't because you know how you really are. Okay, so now we know God is real. Okay, we know he's aware and personal. We know that he's big enough, but will he? So now the enemy begins to attack your conscience and try to highlight everything in your life that you think disqualifies you from God's favor. He attacks your righteousness. He's the accuser of the brethren. And the Bible says, now is the accuser of the brethren cast down. 
Now is the kingdom and the power of our God. So in other words, God has kingdom power that he wants to get to you, but you need to have it settled in your heart, your mind, and your words that you're good with God, right? Well, Jesus came, and he bore the penalty of our sins, which gave you right standing with God by faith alone, not by performance. Because the devil always points to your lack of performance, uh, your failure, things that you say, what you allow to come out of your mouth yesterday, right? And tries to bring you into a place of sin consciousness to disqualify you from the power of God. But when you get revelation of what Jesus did, you cast that down. Then comes the kingdom and the power of our God, right? You are guilt-free. There is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, period, right? Now, if you miss it, you need to repent, right? Because he said, if we sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So unrepented sin, yes, will give the, de the enemy access. But how hard is it to say to God, I missed it there, please forgive me. Or to make something right with a person that you might not have dealt correctly with, right? If you hold unforgiveness, there, there's no repentance there, right? It doesn't mean you have to go and make restitution for somebody that you slapped in the face when you were in the playground at five years old kind of thing, right? But if God puts something in your spirit that you need to deal with, put it on the altar for God's sake. It's just stopping the blessings of God, right? So once you know that you have right standing with God and that there's nothing that can stop God's blessing, in order for faith to rise, you have to know that what you're believing for is consistent with the will of God. Amen? Okay, so that next scripture is uh, 1 John 5, 14, I believe. It says, and this is the confidence or the faith that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. The rest of the verse, and, it, and if he hears us, we know that we have from him the petitions that we desire. Well, that's a cool promise, right? But here's the thing. We're believing for something, but now we got to go in the Word and find out if it's the will of God for our life, right? And a lot of things are pretty clear. Things that you should or should not be doing, or you, you should or should not be praying for, right? I mean, let's say, man, you fall in love with your neighbor's wife. Don't waste your time praying right? It ain't going to happen, right? It is an immediate understanding that that is not the will of God, right? Remember, if we ask anything according to his will, but let's say you're single and you'd like to be married and you start praying for that, right? God said, and you found that scripture, every single man knows that scripture in Genesis. It is not good for man to be alone, <laughs> right? And so we start confessing that, Lord, you said it's your will that I be fruitful and multiply, and that's hard by myself, right? <laughs> so, you know, he that, you know what I, listen to me when I was a single man. Remember, we commit these things in memory, man. Whatever it is you're believing God for, right? He that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. No good thing should be withheld from the hand of the righteous. And he who knew no sin became sin for me that I might be made the righteousness of God. Thank you for my wife. <laughs> Come on. That's called a spiritual syllogism. That means I come at Jesus three, eight, three ways, but nothing, man. I got three scriptures in there. It's just like, he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And the devil's, yeah, but wait, I'm not done, devil. And no good thing should be withheld from the hand of the righteous. Yeah, but hey, wait, I'm not done. And he who knew no sin became sin for me that I might become the righteousness of God in him. There's no angle on that, devil. You lose. Sandra, where are you? Come forth, in Jesus' name. Come on, did she come? She come a lot later than I thought she'd come, but she came, praise God. Amen. Our God is a God of promise. But you can't believe for, for what you you can't believe for what you are unaware of. We can't afford to be strangers to the covenants of promise because we don't know what God said he'd give us, right? I once uh oh dear Jesus. I got five minutes. Okay, very quickly. No, no. Um, there are warehouses in heaven full of full of things that God wants to give us, but we, a lot of it remains untapped because people don't believe for it. 
God spoke to me once and he said, heaven is not, uh, salvation is not about going to heaven. It's about pulling heaven down to earth. And I thought, oh, wow, I can do that. But faith, right? We're talking about building our faith, laying foundations for our pyramid of faith. The last thing we need to know is faith works by love. So when we're praying, we know we got God's will, we got God's promise, right? But God will say, okay, I, I see that, but why? Why do you want it? Motives are important. If you have selfish intentions and you're trying to manipulate God to get something that your flesh wants with his word, it's not going to work. You're going to short circuit it, right? And we make excuses for things we want, try to make it spiritual. I, sh I share this story, but I'll share it again for the handful of people that weren't here. I spent $5,000 building a tree house in my backyard. And I got two thirds of the way through with it, and it was like an awesome, like, magazine kind of tree house. And the Lord is like, What are you doing? I'm like, What? I'm building a tree. He said, You wasted five five thousand dollars of kingdom resources on this ridiculous tree house. I was convicted, but I got out of it. Well, Lord, it's a it's a prayer tower. You see how we try to put a spiritual spin on something that our flesh wants, right? Believers do that, right? So when you're believing for something, you need to examine your motives, right? Because God sees your heart, right? And he's not going to be manipulated with, like, it's a prayer tower thing, right? And, you know, I never finished it, and it rained, and it got ruined and everything because I, I built it so high I was afraid to go and put a roof on it. It was so high. Now it's a monument to distraction. Whenever I'm tempted to distraction, I go outside and go, yep, I'm distracted again. It's a reminder. It's a memorial of stupidity is what it is. <laughs> Faith works by love. So it's not just, okay, am I wanting this for, uh, am I moved with compassion on somebody's behalf and I'm believing for finances so I can help people? Am I believing for a, a new car so that I can do more for the kingdom. If I get this car, will I pick people up and take them to church that don't have a car and can't get there? I mean, you know, these are the questions you need to ask yourself. Or do I just want to like, you know, teenagers, and I want the new truck with the mega payments. And the main reason I want it is so I can drive 10 times around the high school. Boom, 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 boom. Check out the ride, right? I can remember so many kids in high school that used to do that revolution, and that revolution lasted about three months till they got their first payment. <laughs> They're like, wow, I can't do this. And then at repo, right? But here's the bigger thing about faith worketh by love. You have to know how much God loves you. You need a revelation of God's love for you. Because if I'm struggling a little bit financially and then all of a sudden somebody comes up and said, the Lord told me to give you two grand. I'm like, praise the Lord. That's going to lift the pressure off my life, right? And then he says, uh, Tim, I'm giving you that two grand because uh, La Carlos has been praying. He needs finances. I want you to give him the two grand. Now, am I gonna, if, if I'm not sure how much God loves me and cares for me, if I have abandonment issues in my history and I think I cannot afford to believe God and I cling to that $2,000 as my source of deliverance, I don't really know how much God loves me. Right? Sometimes my daughter will be like looking at the phone. I, I can't even believe some of this stuff. I give my daughter the phone not very often, but if I'm doing dishes or something and I'm watching her, I put it on a little video, a Barbie video, right? And if that video ends, it, she just scrolls up to the next Barbie video, right? That's a poor man's babysitter is what it is. And, uh, but then all of a sudden, right in the middle, be sandwiched between two Barbie programs, becomes a trailer for a horror movie that pops up. 
And my, my daughter comes running in with tears in her eyes and jumps up in my lap and said, what is wrong? What did Marvy do? <laughs> right? And I scroll back and I see and I'm here. What irresponsible idiot is putting horror movie trailers in children's videos? And I'm like, that's the devil, right? So she comes up and she's clinging to me. And the only way I can think of is you don't need to be afraid, uh, Hannah. Daddy's got this. And I looked her in the eye and I said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You do not need to be afraid. And it assuages her fear, right? So now whenever anything is weird, she can come to daddy. Oh, he's, my daddy's got this, right? Now, I'm not, I'm not going to tell her I don't really got it. I'm just saying, I know a guy, right? <laughs> and, and he'll take care of us, right? Because she's not there yet, right? You know, I feel I told Sandra straight up. I said, I'm not as young as I used to be, right? So if we get in a street fight, you better you better scratch and claw. <laughs> because I'm probably good for about two punches and I'll be too winded to do anything else. So we need to trust our angels, praise God, right? But we're teaching Hannah to trust God, right? But I want her to know she can come to me and God wants you to know you can go to him. Right? The Bible says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those that are his children, right? I can't, I, I can't even express in words my love, the love that I have for my daughter. God gave me that as a gift and said, you see what you feel towards her? Now magnify that 100,000 times, and that's my feeling towards you. I'm like, what? Right? And so that begins to build faith in me, and I begin to trust that whenever there's a need, God's got this. He won't let me go down, right? There are so many other areas, so many other stones, building stones of faith that you need to lay. Like I said, identity in Christ's realities, a revelation of the righteousness, which is by faith. But stay in the word. And, and let God breathe on the revelations that you will use to take you to your next level of faith. Graham Cook would go through some difficult things and God would speak to him. Graham, what are you worried about? I got this. And he says, well, Lord, this is serious. And the Lord told him to ask this question every time he came up against something. He said, Lord, what is it that you want to be to me today in this situation that you couldn't be to me at any other time? If you're going through something and it looks dark, look, it as an opportunity to learn something about the goodness of God. God, what do you want to be to me today in this situation? What facet of yourself do you want to reveal to me in this situation that you couldn't reveal to me at any other time? And God will get involved and you'll learn something new about God and you'll come up out of that and you'll be a testimony to the world. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below, and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.